Hey, good morning, Ben here with Studio on the Lake. Here is uh, the video of the black cap chickadee. This looks like it's going to be two parts, but uh, here he is when he's done. Uh, I like the way he turned out. I did paint him a little uh, when I was sitting kind of in the dark without the lights. I, if I did anything, I would go back and, and do a little more work on the feathers there. But all in all, I like the position. I like where he went. And uh, I think we're going to call this a master class. Uh, you can leave the comments uh, down in there if you agree or disagree, and it's all good. So there he is. He was mounted on a little little piece of uh, driftwood, and he was designed to hang on the wall. And I, I got the position so his head was up and that sort of thing, and I may uh, put another piece on there. So a lot of people ask what the references are and, uh, anymore. Unless I'm doing a competition piece, I'll just pull a reference off the web. And it's just a photo, and I cut it out. Now, when you're using a photo like that, you got to keep in mind that the angle that they took it from may not give you a, a good profile. So here's a, a chunk of basswood, and you can see uh, that guy there. Uh, not a true profile, so I'm going to leave a little bit extra on it. Uh, if you're taking a photograph for a reference to pull uh, a pattern off of, it's best to have it straight on from the side straight on from the front or uh, and even if you can get it from straight above bird's eye view looking directly down anytime you take a subject and turn it slightly to the side you kind of wreck that profile so keep that in mind when you when you when you're uh, grabbing a pattern uh, off of just a photograph in the old days they used to take photographs of things and, and uh, intentionally turn them sideways so people couldn't rip off a pattern so you can see there's the rough shape. I left a lot of room. It's a lot wider than it needs to be, and uh, I didn't bother to mess around uh, cutting the tail off there uh, on the bandsaw. It was just too small a piece, and I figured I'd grab it later. I'll show you how I do that. Uh, so this is basswood. This is air-dried basswood. Uh, you can get into an argument with folks on whether air-dried or kiln-dried is better. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, any wood, you, any basswood you can get your hands on, uh, then uh, use that. And, and, and different trees will have different hardness on it. So uh, sometimes it's a little too hard to work with a knife, but then again, grab a piece of oak for a little while and whittle on that, and you'll be very happy to go back to your basswood. So as always, we're going with references. On this one, you notice that I'm turning the head to the side. I've talked about this before. If you do, a lot of beginners will do a static profile. Uh, and then the, the piece, when they're done, looks static. It looks like it's uh, straight on. So the, the goal to a lot of these, uh, and a lot of carvings, is to, is to put a little character into it. Uh, you can do that many ways, but a lot of times it's by tilting a head, uh, sl slouching shoulders if you're doing character carving. Uh, hands in pockets, that sort of thing. So, um, initially, when you're beginning carver, just, just go ahead and carve. But as you get a little more proficient with it, you're going to want to start thinking about various different poses. Uh, this uh, is interesting on this part right here. I decided to strop the knife. I tend to, and this 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 doesn't turn out to be a good example, but I, I tend to sharpen or strop more on one side than the other, which would leave the knife. Uh, blade not symmetrical on the end but typically and it's almost always that that uh, left side I'll do 20 strokes and then 10 on the other and then 15 and then 5 that's something along those lines I don't strop evenly I don't know why uh, but it seems to work uh, for what I'm doing and this was a fairly hard piece of basswood so I initially grabbed the knife just to uh, get that uh, torn down on there and this will have to go into the power carving. In fact, it goes in there fairly rapidly. But a lot of times when I'm initially working on the shape, I like to go through and, uh, and do it with a knife. And you'll see me grab those back and forth. So I'm not a pure power carver, nor am I a pure uh, hand knife carver. So what I'm trying to do now is I've got that head tilted off a little bit to the left. And uh, somehow or other, I have to get a head out of this, and I, I want to leave the beak. 
So I, I left just a little bit of the beak sticking out. When you're doing birds, a uh, beginner mistake would be to either leave too much beak out on the end as you're roughing it out or not enough and uh, and then not committing it. This one almost bordered, he had, if you look at the reference photo, he has a really small beak. And uh, initially I thought maybe I, I left too little on this, but uh, it turned out it turned out to be just right by the time I carved the forehead back and, and left left the beak in there. So mo most of this is done two times faster and you, you'll notice that I almost always work on the head first. If I get the head right and I get an attitude, uh, once I have the head where I want it and then I can look at the rest of it and see if I've got enough wood or enough body left to support the head. If, if the head is bad, the whole carving is bad. Consequently, if the body is not quite right on a decoy or a bird, then you can get away with that in a lot of cases with a spectacular head because the focus point is almost always the head. So I'm just rounding, uh, kind of working that head down and, and getting it out. I'm, I'm turning it all around. As always, I have center reference lines in there and I'm trying to pull the head out of this. I've talked about it before and you can see it as you look through it. When I'm looking at it, what I'm looking at, I'm looking at it from above and I'm trying to get the left and right side symmetrical. And then I'll turn him sideways and look through him. There it is. I'm looking through him behind him to see uh, what kind of profile the front of that needs to be. I I'm working today on a uh, I'm doing the voiceover on this on, on a Monday. I'm down here in Iowa till Thursday, but uh, I am uh, reworking a deal on the hand pieces. That, that hand piece came from PJL Enterprises in the Ultima Combo, and I, I did spend some time and put a whole um, video together. And then, like I said, a couple weeks ago, I talked to Pat over at PJL, and he's not doing the Ultimas anymore. A couple of you have expressed uh, comments on if he's fixing those uh, hand pieces or not. He is, uh, as far as I know, uh, I spent about two hours with him on the phone. He still probably will fix your hand piece. Um, and that's one of the benefits. And you're going to see that when I work on this uh, video later today. The hand pieces primarily came from Korea, China, and Japan, as near as I can tell on my research. And they are relatively the same. There are a few differences in there, and I'll, I'll talk about those in the videos but the the moral of the story is I'm not a hundred percent convinced uh, the PGL combo burner or combo was around 400 bucks with for a burner and a power carver the uh, individual ones were in the 250 to 300 range I believe and don't quote me on this uh, and I think it's reasonable for a beginner carver to spend three to four hundred bucks somewhere in the 300 400 buck range to get a quality power carver but I'm not sure that you can get one that'll last like mine have for 20 plus years and uh, you'll get my opinion on a couple of these when we we get into now I, I'm uh, pretty sure that you, when you get in the 750 to a thousand dollar range that you can get a quality handpiece a quality controller motor but uh, a lot of us would have trouble convincing ourselves and our significant others that, hey, I need to drop 750 bucks on a, a hobby that I'm not sure I'm going to like or not, and it's going to make a hell of a mess. Uh, but those of you that, that, uh, that do this, I, I think I would start with a um, a cheaper one, like the one I reviewed, the Marathon 3 or something like that. For You can get pick them up for 50, 80 bucks. Uh, they probably won't run more than a month or two but you can decide if you want to do this. And by the time you spend uh, by five uh, quality bits, like that uh, cuts all that's in there at 15 bucks a pop, um, then you'll have a, a, a little bit of an investment in it. And if you're, not, if you're interested, the, the bits will, are transferable primarily as long as you get the correct call it. But uh, I'm gonna talk about in that, that video um, the difference between a flex cable and, and this hand, these hand pieces and, and whatnot and, and all that. So 
if I get it put together the way I got it in my brain, it, it should be an interesting one if you're uh, looking for or thinking about uh, purchasing a power carver or uh, a lot of you guys I know just uh, watch this for the fun of it. So here he is and I, I got his head where I wanted it. I, I could see the head uh, was going to come out all right. And I wasn't really concerned about it. He's got a, a little bit of an attitude. His, his, his beak is tilted up and uh, he'll be standing kind of stretched forward is what I'm thinking. So as I'm going along on, on these pieces, uh, I, I'm always kind of thinking about what the end result's going to be. And this guy, I, I, I like how he turned out. He turned out real nice. Got no, com no complaints whatsoever. I, I knew that I wasn't going to get this in, in one video because it is a teaching video. It probably should be three. I hope not. I haven't edited the second portion with the burning and the feather stoning and that sort of stuff. And then as, as usual, I don't give you uh, a painting uh, video on this. Because uh, painting, I, I, it's too cold to paint out in the studio uh, with acrylics. I, I, I tend to be lazy and leave stuff sitting around and, and then the water would freeze. I, I paint in the house, sitting in my chair. Uh, out on on the porch where we have the TV big screen TV and that sort of stuff and uh, I do it relaxing and I don't have a camera set up there and I'm too lazy to do a camera set up there one of these days I'll, I'll probably show you painting is more painful to watch than carving for some reason and uh, I just tend not not to film it you get to see the results of a couple hours worth of painting so as usual, I'm just working this guy around and around. And if, if, as this is a tutorial, you'll notice I, I decided it was time to, to see if I could get his beak out and get his forehead correct. And in a, in a few minutes here, I'm gonna do the crazy part that may or may not ruin this guy. So as you're looking through him, you, you can see that he is uh, a bird, obviously, and a chickadee. If, if you're familiar with those, kind of a standard. I can see the shape. I've kind of got it out of the wood there. And I've got enough room to do the body. I'm, I'm leaving excessively uh, thick up on the top, on the back and the, around the tail because there's gonna be uh, wing feathers that cross over. I am looking at the reference over on my right side uh, on my stand. I do have a nail and I just poke that uh, pattern that I use. I stick it over a nail and I will glance over at that guy once in a while. So I've switched to the second hand piece and uh, it's got a ruby bit in it and that's a 332nd collet in that one and the, the other one is an eighth inch collet uh, on the blue hand piece. I do have to admit, I think this black hand piece is, is much better built uh, than the blue one. And it doesn't matter anymore because uh, Pat's not making those anymore or, or modifying them. He, he did explain to me a couple of modifications he made. And uh, when I get back, I'm gonna take a look at that cheap marathon one and, and see if, if that's the difference. I hesitate to tear apart uh, the two that I have that are working although this desire to, to dig down in there and look at, look at the parts and pieces of these things is, is interesting. But I, I don't have any intention of uh, going into business selling hand pieces and uh, that sort of thing. And I, I would actually probably, I'd be afraid to ruin one of my good ones. Why break something that's broke? Many, many years ago, uh, stuff would end up in my garage. I'd, I'd be deployed uh, downrange in Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere like that, Kosovo, and I'd come home after six months or a year and find various different things in the garage, sewing machines, fans, and whatnot. And then uh, I would tear them apart and make something else out of them or throw them away. And then my wife, my wife one time made the comment, you never fix anything, everything you break. And I had to explain to her that, uh, hey, it's in my garage cluttering up the space because it quit and it broke 
at that point it's dead. If I fart around with it and uh, try to fix it and decide that I can't fix it and turn it into something else like a mini lathe, that's not my fault. The thing was broke to start with, so it's dead at that point. Anything I do to it after that uh, doesn't hurt it. She never agreed with me, but that's all right. That's the way that stuff works, right? So uh, you saw a couple of pinholes in there. I didn't show you that. I, I pulled the eye position with a, a tack pin off of the pattern on the one side, and then I took a second tack pin and put it in the other side of the head and moved it around until they were symmetrical and centered. If you get these eyes put in there just a little bit different, they will read okay from either side. But when you look above them or to the front where you can pick up both eyes, a lot of times you'll get some funky thing going, some uh, Pablo Picasso deal going where one eye is all wonky up in the front and uh, the other one's wacky in the back. Of course, if you put three eyes in there, then you'd probably be more like a, a Pablo Picasso thing. So now I'm carving down the tail. And I'm leaving just enough uh, there that I can get the tips of the wings that are going to cross over and then the shape of the tail. Again, you don't want that tail to be straight. Everything you want to do in these is, is stay away from straight lines. You've probably heard it said a hundred times, uh, nature has no straight lines, and I, I suppose that's true. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Um, but here's the, I'm uh, starting to put in the one wing tip, and you can see where I'm coming up over the square on that. And then here would be the second one, which will tuck under the first one. Again, I'm kind of pulling this off of the reference. Had I done this freelance without a reference, I would have probably put the wings a little lower on the body. But since I, I was using a reference, then uh, it's a little bit higher on that. You can see I've still got a, a lot of material up in the back there. That's the eye channel, and this is really where the bird's going to start to come alive. I like to try to get the head and get the eyes set in as, as early as I can. So I'm, I'm kind of back to that medium cuts all. Uh, you guys should be checking out Jordy Johnson over there. He, uh, Jordy doesn't use a hand, well he has a couple of hand pieces, but he uses a extreme cuts all and he uses it on a Fordham 4000. And uh, as always, I love watching his stuff. Uh, you guys know that follow us know that we screw around a lot and we do it also with just carve rob so check out just carve rob stuff we're trying to hook calvin uh carves up and then we got uh attention everybody this is calvin calvin carves up and he's going to be carving up okay so you you heard that in the background and uh right in the middle of recording doing the voiceover uh, they decided that I needed to go to work. So that's what it sounds like when I get toned. Uh, we went out and did a scene flight, took a couple hours, and uh, now I'm back. So it's interesting when they when they do that. You see those eye sockets being cut in there. Uh, that little tapered burr does that for you. But uh, anyhow, one of the first things they tell you in the EMS business, uh, I'm a helicopter uh, pilot, as you know, uh, and, and uh, that you're supposed to remain calm. The first thing they do is send off some crazy tone, doo -doo, which immediately sets you up to the ceiling and gets your adrenaline going. If you haven't been doing this 10 years, and you'll notice that I just kind of heard it in the background and I, I edited the rest of the initial call out of that because uh, that's not information that, uh, that should be shared necessarily. But uh, we went out and did a scene call, brought them back here to the trauma. And uh, now I'm sitting here goofing off again, uh, waiting for the rest of the time. So in, in this, I have a, uh, a little ruby or sapphire bit, and uh, I'm it's a taper also, probably my second favorite, uh, probably my first favorite bit, this one right here, because uh, I, I do a lot of smaller 
uh, stuff in a, this is just like sanding you could do this with a piece of sandpaper if you wanted to you could carve it down with a knife if you're uh, uh, adept with a knife but uh, now I'm just setting that eye socket in getting ready uh, for it to have the eyes and this is where the bird really starts to come alive I've got the silhouette down the way that I want it and uh, and I'll start marking uh, for the eyes and, and take you through the uh, setting of the eye process here the beauty of this bit versus one of the more aggressive ones it does two things it sands and almost gives you a complete finish and it just and doesn't leave um, uh, deeper scratch marks like if you were using uh, 36 grit sandpaper and trying to do a tabletop it looked pretty rough this kind of does the same thing but, but it also carves in addition to sanding I can get it's pretty aggressive if you put some pressure into it and, and I don't need to on this I, I'm just kind of you know, someone's commented before it looks like I'm, I'm using a pencil and, and that's a really good analogy you can see I'm carving a little deeper down in, in the body there where I've got the neck coming down and I've said it over and over again I, I turn the piece around and work on various different sections at one time I, I did not try to define the head in fact the head's not completely where I want it yet uh, but I take a little bit down all the way around uh, and make it symmetrical and look through the piece and uh, eventually we get down to where we need to be so it takes a little bit of patience if I'm not filming, uh, this is actually quite enjoyable. Uh, when I'm filming, it takes a little bit of work. I have to make sure that uh, I'm in frame. I have to make sure that uh, what I'm doing makes sense to various different people and, uh, and whatnot. So it takes a little bit of work. Those of you that post YouTube videos, you know that it takes some work to get that done. So this guy's pretty much, uh, he's looking like a bird now. There was a guy years ago, my wife has some pictures of, uh, or not pictures, but she has several little birds that she bought up in uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, or around those parts when she was a teenager. And uh, a guy carved birds and sold them at the local tourist tribe, but he didn't uh, put feathers on them. He didn't put glass eyes in them. They had wooden eyes, uh, had very, like maybe three or four strokes of paint on them and then little wire feet and he'd stick them on a piece of driftwood or a piece of wood and he'd sell them for 15 or 20 dollars that's uh, 30 40 years ago and they're just awesome they have the silhouette they're 3d they're carved in the round uh, he just didn't go through all the pain in the butt that this guy gets which is uh, delineating all the feathers and continuing on down so you could probably do a little bit of finish carving do the tail obviously take the feathers off the back sand this guy and leave him just like this maybe put a quick stain coat on there or whatnot so here's here's uh, my Tohican glass eyes this is the newest shipment uh, I'm gonna end up with a five millimeter I think and these are ones that are on a wire I, I do like the wire ones these are a little more expensive than the separate ones I don't use the wire uh, to stick in there you see I bent that wire to 90 degree and I'm looking at it I, I like the size and shape of that eye That's a saber uh, burr there, and it, it allows me to cut that eye socket in there deep. And you'll see here that I, I go ahead and cut these uh, off the wire because I don't leave the wire in the back. A lot of times if you're doing a bigger piece of carousel or something, you'll leave some of this wire coiled up in the back and it, it helps keep the eye in. Although I have never uh, had a problem. And I, I use quick wood, which you'll see in a second, but I have never had a problem with an eye popping out. One of the dangers you'll see of these eyes uh, here eventually is uh, they're so small and they're, these are probably four or five bucks a piece or, or well for a set not a piece and you don't want to lose these in the sawdust and the chips and that sort of stuff down below. I, I do when I when I get around to clean up the shop which I don't do nearly enough. Here's the quick wood. I will sift through that before I, I throw it away and a lot of times I'll find an eye that I lost or I'll find uh, a $15 burr that I also lost or dropped in the sawdust down there in the nature of the business. If I were to grab the vacuum cleaner and just suck all that crap up I'd end up uh, losing money on the whole proposition although this, this carving uh, 
is a losing proposition anyway. It's a hobby. Let's face it, my day job is that uh, when that tone goes off back in the other side, that and my uh, military retirement keeps me going. This is for fun. And in a few years, I'll, I'll just uh, stop doing the rest of that and uh, sit out here all day and carve, which will be kind of fun. So this epoxy sets up, uh, this quick wood sets up in 10 to 30 minutes, give or take, and it's hard. You can carve it. They say you can stain it and paint it, although you use that with a grain of salt. Um, you have to do a little, little bit more work to get that to match uh, the, the painted wood around it. It's not as simple as uh, one coat of paint over the head, if you were, in this case, or over the place where you put the putty and it'll look the same. It won't because it, it absorbs the paint at a different rate. So you end up with a couple layers or uh, even, uh, I don't use a lot of it anymore, uh, you put a gesso coat, a seal coat on there, maybe some shellac or something along those lines, uh, whatever you like to seal uh, your woodworking projects with. And then you put a couple of coats of gesso on there, which gives you a real nice paint surface uh, to go through. That's what I'll do on the competition pieces. You have to be careful not to build the gesso up to the level where you obscure all that work you put in on the feathers. So uh, using that knife, that, uh, that homemade knife from many years ago, I used to carve with that exclusively all the time. And now I don't. When you're uh, playing around with these eyes, uh, you'll see what happens with this deal here. I talked about dropping them. Uh, they're really hard, and I don't. I used to have a pair of tweezers. I sat over there, and I don't have those anymore. But if you drop them like that, fortunately, that one was not. Uh, a major crisis and we got the eye right side up and poked into the socket. Th that knife has the back side of that knife is carved off. Uh, it's a homemade handle and a homemade knife but uh, the back of it's carved off with a little bit of a concave and I use that primarily to set eyes. I've used that probably for 10 or 15 years to set eyes and uh, occasionally I will carve with this. I used to carve with this all the time until I got that Ramelson uh, bench knife, which I like. And this is secondary. You can see that blade's a little worn down, but uh, I'll clean that off if uh, I'm gonna carve with it and a couple of quick strops, maybe run it over the diamond hone real quick and that thing's ready to go. So I push those eyes in there and I clean this stuff off. And then at this point, I just do one more little push and it leaves kind of a small, uh, perfect eyelid over it. in this case I took a lot of that off but you'll see later on when I in and, and that really makes to me make that's when the bird comes alive when he gets that glass eye in there or if you carve an eye in there and if you carve it in there of course you don't uh, get the painting on it until later so that kind of detracts from it and I, I just think there's nothing quite like the glass eyes they they bring quite another dimension although there are certain projects that I I will carve the eyes in uh, because that's what it, the carving calls for um, and also the expense I, I do some larger muskies that are three feet long uh, that are, are kind of a folk art muskie and to put a, a 22 or 26 millimeter eye in that will set you back about 25 or 30 dollars in a lot of cases it just makes more sense to carve that eye in and it looks fine so we've got the eyes set in there and it does make the bird come alive. And you can see that I, I still haven't quite defined some of the stuff that's going on uh, underneath his beak. His beak is not refined. We've got no feathers on the back of this character, but I do have enough room and space uh, for him to do what I, what I need him to do. Now, this is a little ball diamond bit, and I'm just using it because it's very gentle, and I, I, it does two things for me. One, I'm starting to define the cheeks down to where before I start putting the feather groups in there. 
The ball allows me to go in any general direction that I want. Whereas a taper, you're almost limited to uh, left and right with the taper. But this also leaves a little pocket that if, if I didn't do anything else on this, and you can, you can see it if you use your imagination, there's almost a feather-like uh, appearance or little bumps that I'm leaving behind because I'm, I'm doing little round pockets now, almost as if I took this thing and, and jabbed it and poked it I would get, end up with little round divots but I, I'm moving this down and I am I, I apologize I didn't mark this and I should have to show you uh, where I was going with the, the feather so I, I did do it on this side but I didn't do it on the other side as I'm going along I'm trying to think what do you uh, who are watching this and those of you especially that want to uh, follow along and carve something or are trying to learn something I try to explain what I'm up to and uh, you can uh, just like everybody else you can take uh, my technique or my opinion if it works for you if it doesn't you can uh, develop your own but everybody needs a starting point so what I didn't do on that other side was I didn't draw those reference lines in and uh, so there they are and I would come back just like with this little bit. And you can see I'm taking really small bites off of this. And I'm getting the other shapes in. This also allows me to put a little bit of an eyelid uh, around that guy. And I'm still not doing the beak, but I'm getting the transition area down into the beak. You wanna be really careful. Uh, that diamond bit, if it touches that glass eye, that will score it. And uh, if you're doing a competition piece at that point, you'll be uh, gouging that eye out. That sounds pretty tacky, doesn't it? Gouging the eye out. Be taking that eye out and putting another eye in there and throwing that $5 bill down the drain. If you're doing something like this, and this one I did not tag it, uh, but you can take some clear fingernail polish and put it over the crack. And uh, it, the eye will look a little bit muddier than, than it was, uh, but it, it will fix that and, and people won't know that you, you tagged it. The eye just turns out to be not as quality as it would have without the fingernail polish. So you can see that I'm coming, I'm following down along those lines, those reference lines that I put in there. And I, I can't emphasize enough unless you really know what you're doing and have done a hundred of these. Uh, if I wasn't doing this for um, a teaching video, I probably would not put those lines in. Because I, 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 I kind of know where I'm going with it and, and how to get the end result. I guess the moral of the story uh, here on when you start getting to this point here is uh, slow and steady. If you've left enough wood, if you, if you get it down to the initial shape, which I showed you earlier when we put the eye in, uh, we could probably leave it alone. And everything we do from here out it works off of that initial shape. So if you, there, there was a guy in Minnesota many years ago, I, I never met him, but my wife has a couple of his birds who would just do a silhouette of a bird. Uh, and then, uh, and that's not a good example. It was 3D, but uh, he didn't do any feathers. He just carved the bird out, uh, carved an eye into it, and then uh, mounted it with wire feet. And he would sell those in those days for 15 or $20. A piece and, and you knew exactly what kind of bird it was and it was pretty awesome and it was just uh, one of those guys that uh, local guys that did something for a tourist section and uh, this bird's almost at the level where you could get away with that if I sanded him smooth uh, I could stick two wire feet in him and uh, you would have an idea and not particularly what species he is because uh, let's face it uh, sparrow black cat cap chickadee etc etc all tend to kind of look alike. Um, a lot of the robins will look like different birds uh, until you paint them and then they become what they are obviously because they're a feather grouping. So you can see, I, I'm taking just uh, little small cuts and, 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 and I'm, I'm looking at it all the way around and I, I'm taking off pieces. I'm always going with the flow of the feathers, but I'm, I'm trying to get that particular look 
and not change it and, and there I just one stroke kind of finished that beak out and we'll get a little bit more when we start putting the feather groups on there but uh, this is where I'm going to leave the first first video and uh, thanks for watching it's been Ben with Stude on the Lake and I will get the second part of that out and I will also get out uh, one on the power carvers.